uh, Larry Jones, our senior curator, who's going to give you a little bit of an introduction to the museum. Take myself off mute to start with, that'll help, won't it? So welcome everyone. Um, we're really sad not to be able to welcome you into the building and to see the physical exhibition, but I know that Kate is going to do a really excellent job about conjuring it up for you instead this evening. So we can't really give you a sense of the building and the museum very well over the web, but I think Gail has got a picture that we can show that will hopefully give you a little taste of what it would be like to be in the museum. So this shows one of our permanent displays. This is part of our medical collection. So one of our sort of exciting objects at a big surgical chest. For those of you who aren't familiar with the RCP, we're a medical charity that represents approximately 38,000 doctors, so 38,000 physicians worldwide. Our core mission is to improve patient health and reduce illness, um, but as well as being a modern healthcare charity, so working to raise standards, support the medical workforce, that sort of thing, we're also an organisation with a 500 year history, slightly over because the 500th birthday was in 2018, so 502 to be exact. Um, this history is looked after by us, so the Library, Archive and Museum Services Department. And we care for a huge range of collections, so everything from rare books and artwork to medical instruments, as you can see in the picture, silverware, letters, manuscripts, you know, whatever you can think of pretty much. And these collections cover the history of the college itself, but they also cover the general history of medicine and also of broader subjects that show the interests of doctors and of physicians over the years. And as well as all of those historic things, we also have a modern reference library. In slightly more normal times, all of these things would be available for you to visit. So both for research and to look at around the building. So we have huge amounts of our collections actually out on display in our Regents Park headquarters. Um, and they're also obviously used in our active exhibitions and events programme. So while we're not quite ready to reopen the building yet, you know, it is something we're working on. Um, we're really pleased to instead be able to put this on, so to be able to do things digitally and still, you know, welcome you towards our collections and get to show you some really cool stuff. We usually have a late opening of the museum on the first Thursday of every month, but for the rest of this year, so from today, um, every month until December, we instead have digital versions. So 6 p.m., first Thursday of the month, um, with a focus on the Under the Skin exhibition. Today's is curatorial, sort of brought a broad covering of the exhibition itself with Katie, who is our rare books and special collections librarian and also the curator of this exhibition. And the following three will be focusing on the work of contemporary artists whose pieces are in the exhibition and kind of their involvement in the exhibition and their work more broadly. So, you know, please come back and join us for those as well. We also have a number of digital events for Open House on Saturday the 19th of this month. And as of today, which I'm really excited about, we have an online version of Under the Skin, which you can go and have a look at later on. So once Katie's whetted your appetite a bit, you can go and explore that further on our website. Um, so I think that's about it for me. I'm sorry if I seem to be looking all over the place, there's a lot going on on my screen, but you know, you've very much got my attention. Um, so without further ado, I think I need to hand over to Katie for your exhibition tour. Okay, thank you very much, Lowry. Um, I'm just gonna check that Lowry and Gail think they can hear me, so nod or something. Yeah, great. Hopefully everyone else is hearing me as well. If you're not, then please say in the chat and we'll do something about that. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming today. Uh, this is the first time I've done a tour like this online. And um, so please do bear with me if anything goes wrong or if um, we all just need to be a bit patient while I sort things out. I'm already noticing that there might be a light issue. Um, I'm sitting opposite a window and I think there's going to be light coming, working across this way. So hopefully the sun will go behind cloud. If it doesn't, I might just have to jump up from my chair at some point and pull a curtain. Um, but I hope we can all <laughs> bear with that. Um, for this tour, you will probably find you get the best view of the slides. If you move, you can click and drag or hold and drag um, the little box with my face on it down. If you move that to the bottom right hand corner of your screen, I've designed the slides so that should mean uh, minimal interruption to the pictures I'm showing. Now, this tour of Under the Skin Art, Anatomy, Art and Identity is going to be a real whistle stop. Um, I'm going to try and do about a half hour tour so we've got lots of time for discussion afterwards. 
and um, we've got over 50 historical works and contemporary artworks by 14 different artists in the show. So it's going to be um, a real highlights tour. I won't be able to include everything that was in the physical version. But like Larry says, you can go online as of today and look at the online version of the exhibition and explore things in a lot more detail, look at the pictures in more detail, read more about them and um, find out the full details about the books or artworks they come from. Um, because I've just put very brief captions on the slides because um, it's much easier for you to go and look them up afterwards, I think, than to be scribbling down notes from the screen as it whizzes by. Um, so without any further, to do, further ado, let's delve into anatomical illustration. Um, so the initial impetus behind this exhibition was to show off some of the amazing anatomical pictures that we have in the RCP Museum Library and Archives. Um, anatomical pictures are just brilliant. They're gorgeous and interesting and detailed and wonderful, um, as you can see in this, which was one of the lead images for the exhibition. We had it displayed in the exhibition space at well over life size. This man was kind of as tall as I was on the wall so that you could really see the masterful detail in the picture. Um, but it wasn't just to show off our lovely things that we put on this exhibition. It was for a number of other reasons as well. So one was to take part in a project called Thinking 3D. Um, I just need to, there we go, find the next slide for myself. Um, Thinking 3D was a multi-year interdisciplinary research project masterminded by academics at the University of St Andrews and Oxford, which looked at the ways that three-dimensionality has been represented on the page since the time of Leonardo da Vinci. Last year was the 500th anniversary of da Vinci's death. And um, there was a big exhibition at the Bodleian Library and a number of other exhibitions all around the country and um, at least one in the USA as well, looking at different ways that people have shown the three dimensional world on the two dimensional page throughout artistic history. And so I thought it would be great to participate in this project, not least because one of the star items in our museum collection um, is something that really sits at the borderline between anatomical illustration and three dimensionality and preserved specimens, the sort of things you might expect in a pathology museum. So these objects you see here are what we call the anatomical tables. They are, they are incredibly rare. There are only two known surviving sets of tables like this anywhere in the world. They are preserved human remains. <clears throat> Excuse me. So you can see in the table that you can see in most detail here, um, a preserved human nervous system laid out on a wooden board as if it is a drawing on a page. So the person is kind of spread out to give you a not entirely lifelike um, representation of the nervous system in the human body. The other tables are the circulatory system. And these really got me thinking about the line between what's a drawing and what's a preserved human remain um, and the way that anatomical pictures and preserved specimens and other teaching tools in anatomy all interrelate with each other. But also spending time looking at these tables and thinking about the images we have in our books and archives in the um, RCP really got me thinking about the people in the pictures. Because the people we see in these tables almost certainly didn't consent to be dissected. We don't know for certain because the documents don't survive. We don't know who precisely these people were. Uh, but I think we can be pretty certain they'd be quite surprised to find themselves on display in a medical museum in London. Um, the bodies were prepared in Padua in Italy. Um, 350 years after they died. And it was that that really provided the impetus for creating the exhibition in the form it now exists in, um, which is an exploration not only of anatomical illustration, but also the ethics, the power structures and the emotional responses that are all inherent in displays of anatomical art and human bodies for medical purposes. Um, so here is our first floor exhibition gallery, which is where we stage our temporary exhibitions at the RCP. And this is the exhibition under the skin as it was laid out when we could still go into the building. Um, I'm going to whiz you around the exhibition display case by display case. There are eight different themes. And like I say, it's going to be a bit of a whistle stop tour. Um, also, for anyone who has seen it in person and uh, for my curatorial colleagues who know the exhibition a bit better, I'm going to go out of order because one of the beautiful things about doing things online is that it's really, really easy to move them around compared to moving actual physical display cases about because that gets a bit tricky quite quickly. Um, so the first theme of the exhibition is illustrating the body. And this is really an introduction to some of the various techniques that have been used in 
creating and reproducing images um, in art history. Images on the page are subject to fashion as much as anything else is, as well as being subject in the subject of anatomy to the developments in medical technique and knowledge over time. Um, so we start the exhibition actually with something very contemporary, a work that was commissioned for the RCP Museum from sculptor Angela Palmer for an exhibition we held in 2018 all about the human heart, the circulation of the blood, and one of our historic fellows, William Harvey, who researched the circulation of the blood. Um, so I'm going to jump to a video now so you can see this sculpture in all its glory. This should load and hopefully it should play for everyone at more or less the same time. So hopefully what you could see there was, or are still possibly still seeing, um, is a video of a sculpture um, that Angela created by scanning a human heart, a preserved human heart using an MRI scanner, and then abstracting 18 different layers from it and drawing those on glass plates that she then mounts one in front of each other so that when you stand to the side of it, it seems invisible. When you stand in front, you get all the layers on top of each other. And as you move round the piece, you get this illusion of a three-dimensional heart floating in space in front of you. And that's a very inventive and a very imaginative way of showing the three-dimensionality of the human body. Um, and one of the things I wanted to do in this exhibition is to encourage people to really look at all the different images and think about why they were made, who they were made for, who they were made from, and also the way they achieve their effects, because I don't want to create a hierarchy of some images being better than others, just because they're more recent or more detailed. Um, so I'm going to leap back 500 years now to an illustration from a very small, um, both in terms of size and in terms of thickness, book of anatomy by an Italian physician called Jacopo Berengario de Carpi. Um, and he uses woodblock illustration Wood blocks are a very simple way of printing an image. It's like a potato print, but made from wood. So you carve away from your block all the areas you want to be white and you leave raised the areas you want to be dark. And then you put ink on the dark areas and press paper against it. It's very simple. It's a very efficient, um, comparatively cheap way of reproducing images because it's easy to use wood blocks alongside movable type that's used for printing the rest of a book. Wood blocks get a bad rap sometimes because people say that they're very simplistic, they're very basic, the line work can be quite straightforward. Um, and I don't think that's fair because I think this is really quite a subtle image, even though it uses what you might think a typical sort of wood block lines, very straight lines, quite thick, quite blunt, not terribly precise maybe, but they achieve a brilliant effect in this illustration. They really give us an idea of the texture of the muscles of the human torso. Um, without having to do anything that's really all that complicated. Also, it's a really fun image with this chap lifting up um, his skin in front of us. Now, of course, there are other techniques for reproducing images that are a lot more complicated. And this selection of three together um, were a show the, um, the whole process from beginning to end, really, of creating an illustration for a textbook of pathology printed around the year 1800. So the picture on the left-hand side is a watercolour drawing in sort of brownish chalk and ink um, by artist William Clift. And he was drawing a diseased skull that had been dissected and examined by the physician Matthew Bailey. And then Clift passed his drawing on to another artist, a man called James Bezier II, and he prepared a copper plate that was going to be used for printing. And to do that, he took a sheet of copper and engraved it with a little metal tool and everywhere the, the engraved line goes on the copper, that gets filled with ink and then it gets the, the surface gets cleaned off and the paper gets pressed against the inky copper sheet and you get a very, very detailed, beautiful image out of it. Um, so this is a detail where you can see the final printed image on the right hand side and the original drawing on the left. And you can see how using different sorts of line cross hatching, curved lines, straight lines, and all those features in combination, you get a really three-dimensional sense of the depth and the texture of the skull. However, it isn't the same as the drawing. You can't achieve the same gradations of tone in an engraving as you can in a drawing. And this is a really salutary reminder that there's no such thing as a single authentic 
image of, well, anything, and certainly not of the human body, because every image has been a translation of what someone has seen. And it's depended both on what they've chosen to show us and on the technologies available to them in reproducing the image. So it's important to remember that there is no objective medical image. It's always a process of translation. Um, and that is expressed, I think, very nicely in the next artwork in the exhibition, um, which are nature prints made by artist Amanda Couch. And she makes these by applying ink to a lamb's liver and then pressing paper down on top and producing these images. And she's made a vast series of these pictures. And they're all very beautiful. They're all very detailed. You get quite a visceral sense of the messiness of an animal organ in front of you. Um, but you also see that although this is a very direct method of getting an image from an organ, it isn't always terribly uh, useful medically. It doesn't give us a good sense of the actual shape of a lamb's liver because we're getting all the individual different parts of the animal. And that's an important part of um, Amanda's artistic practice is thinking about the contingencies of life and the way things um, are dependent on chance factors that we can't control. OK, so the next section of the exhibition, now we've had a quick think about some re um, techniques of image reproduction, really dives into the nitty gritty. How do we get these an anatomical pictures? We get them by cutting people open. Um, now, I have never had the privilege of seeing um, a human dissection taking place, but watching and participating in dissections has of course for a long time been a very fundamental part of medical education and it was also a very important part of artistic education for a long time um, and for many it was seen as a rite of passage as well kind of an unpleasant thing that you had to get through um, and we've got some amazing recordings in the RCP archives um, with made with fellows and members of the college talking about all aspects of their medical careers, including their medical training. Um, so what I'm going to do now is play you a short clip with one of our fellows where he talks about his experiences going to post-mortems when he was a medical student and junior doctor, which shows the way that cutting up dead bodies could be a totally everyday part of life for some people, um, which would be quite difficult for me to understand um, and get to grips with, I think, but also the way that it really informed his medical practice for the rest of his career. Um, and while I play this, I'm going to go and try pulling the curtain because this light issue is, I think, just only going to get worse. So I'll just get that going for what you. What I started to realise was the power of physical examination and also very quickly in, in those three years at Liverpool, I learned the value of post-mortem examinations and I was an assiduous uh, at post-mortems. You might laugh at this but they were held on lunch at <laughs> lunchtime. <laughs> In the Liverpool Royal Infirmary, students were invited. They didn't have to go, but they were invited to go to the post-mortems at lunchtime and you could see two or three done. And then you'd see them slicing the liver up and then you'd go to the canteen and they'd have liver on the menu. <laughs> but I, I realised how important a post-mortem was in revealing what had been missed in life. And I got very interested in physical examination and how, how much you could deduce from a physical examination about what was going on inside somebody, much more than, than the average layperson would think. Okay, I hope that clip has played through for everyone. I know sometimes there's a bit of a time lag on them. Um, so I apologise if I've cut off Anthony in mid-flow for you, um, but he is hearable on our website on the online version if you were desperate to hear anything you missed from him. Um, so some of the illustrations in anatom anatomical books uh, really go big on this idea of showing us just what it's like to be looking into a body right in front of us, not just an abstracted anatomy, but really giving us the sensation that we are cutting open the body ourselves. Um, and one of the best examples, I think, in our library collection is this Anatomy of the Human Nerves, uh, published in French by Ludovic Hirschfeld in 1853. Um, for people who are ticking off different uh, types of printing reproduction technology, this is a lithograph 
hand coloured. Lithography is quite complicated and I'm not going to try and explain it now, but it is a really cool technique. Um, so if you want to find out more about printing techniques, the Met Museum in New York have a really good series of explainers and I'd recommend you check those out. But the effect of this technique in this image is to give us this hyper realistic view. The tissues look really shiny and wet. We get a really deep sense of depth and we really feel like we're kind of leaning straight into this body. And the sense of being in the dissecting, dissecting room is heightened by the inclusion of the tools used for dissection. So you can see the metal hooks being used to pull apart, pull away the lungs of this man so that we can see the heart beneath. Um, and we also have in the museum the sorts of equipments that uh, medical students and physicians and anatomists were using to do these dissections. So you can see um, at the bottom here, some of those very hooks um, that were used for real by one of our fellows um, called Sir Wilmot Parker Herringham, which is one of those excellent names we don't have anymore. Um, so these pictures give us a really vivid sense of being there in the room with the cadaver, but sometimes they're also portraits of the people involved. And that's very much the case in a series of over 300 images we have drawn by physician Francis Sibson in the 19th century. Um, I'm going to show you just two from the set, but they are truly amazing. They're life-size pictures that he made using a drawing frame to try and achieve a very accurate depiction of the location and proportion of the organs. And one of the reasons he did that is because he wasn't just interested in the three-dimensional form of the human body, but he was also interested in its four-dimensionality. That is to say, the way it moves and changes over time. Um, we are all moving, our organs are moving all the time. Our digestive system is doing stuff. Our lungs are inflating and um, contracting the whole time as we speak and as and breathe. And as we do that, it moves other things around. And that's what Sibson was interested in this series of pictures. So in the first we see here, the lungs are deflated. They're um, contained just within the top part of the chest cavity. In the second picture in this series, um, which isn't drawn quite as darkly, a tube has been inserted into the throat of this man. And Sibson, or maybe one of his assistants, blew down that tube in order to inflate the lungs. And you can see all the organs have been moved down and away and out. Um, so if anyone's ever sung in a choir or had singing lessons or done yoga or anything else like that, you may well have done breathing exercises where you feel your belly expand and contract as you breathe in and out. And that's what Sibson is illustrating here, um, whilst also providing us with these amazingly lifelike, recognisable portraits of the people who came across his dissecting table. However, anatomical illustration needn't always be lifelike. Sometimes it's abstract and conceptual as well. It can be very useful when teaching about the body or studying the body to reduce it to simple parts so that you can show particular relationships. Um, and that's what the third section of the exhibition is about. Um, so these are two drawings from a non-Western European artistic tradition, which are useful, I think, for reminding us that visual imagery is very much um, a thing we learn to understand. We learn visual conventions and we don't necessarily notice we're doing it until we're faced with conventions from someone or somewhere else that we're not familiar with. So these images might look peculiar, unusual to us, but that's probably just because we haven't seen a lot of Persian anatomical illustration before. They come from a very long line of anatomical um, illustrations that tend to be repeated very similarly, um, used to accompany the work of Mansur, um, a Persian anatomist working around the year 1400. These two examples come from the 17th and 18th centuries and they show us the human nervous system. And I like these pictures for lots of reasons. Um, a couple of them is that it, they use really kind of feathery lines to show us the nerves, which I think is a really effective way of showing the way the nervous system works. You know, it spreads out these tiny fibres all throughout the body without having to actually draw in each of the tiny fibres, which would take quite a long time and wouldn't be very revealing. It would get just a, a big mess. And the second is a much more technical aspect. When you look at the head of the two figures, you see that there are eyes kind of halfway up or two thirds of the way up the head. And then above those is a nose pointing upwards. And then above that, right at the top of the head is a mouth. And that is a visual signifier, a visual code to tell us that what we're seeing is this body seen from the back with the person's head thrown up and backwards like this. 
and we're seeing it from behind. So you get the mouth at the top and then the nose and then the eyes below. And it's just a very simple thing you do when you're drawing the head, but it immediately gives you a piece of useful information for interpreting the image. Okay, another um, non-Western image from the collections is this amazing Japanese scroll. This is from the 1820s, um, an era in Japan when uh, dissection of human bodies started to become more acceptable, but practiced within quite closed schools of people who kept the knowledge to themselves. And this image combines aspects of traditional Japanese medicine and Japanese artistic styles with a Western approach to illustrating the internal organs of the body. So we see both um, the uh, intestines and the stomach and some of the major blood vessels and all sorts of things in this woman, but we also see acupuncture points on her skin and the text relates the one to the other. So it's mapping the relationships between the inside and the outside. Um, this scroll is an absolute beauty because it's so vividly illustrated. It's about five meters long. So that tiny strip across the top of the screen shows you the, the full length of the scroll. Um, and you can see the whole thing online in the online exhibition. Um, so you can see a video of the whole scroll and you can actually dig down um, in a digitized version and explore the, the different sections. Um, and it's really well worth a look, I would say. Um, these pictures are maybe less visually striking, but they're also a useful illustration of the way the insides and the outsides of the body can be mapped together. The picture on the left comes from the case books of a physician called Henry Head, and the image on the right is from one of his published articles. And what Head did was, I mean, he didn't only work on heads, he worked on the whole body. I've just chosen heads because it, it was a convenient picture. Um, he used the symptoms of the disease shingles caused by the herpes virus in order to map the relationship of the sensory nerve fibers in the body between the skin where you feel the sensation and the spinal column which connects them to your brain and so he documented hundreds and hundreds of cases of people who had shingles noting where they had a rash where they had pain where they had other sensation and use that to construct the, the map of the body you see on the right hand side, which shows the different areas of the skin which are controlled or um, get sensation from different nerve fibres up and down the spine. Um, so this was really groundbreaking work. It's worth noting that Henry Head wasn't terribly nice and he didn't actually care all that much about these poor people suffering with shingles, which is a miserable disease to have. Um, but some important work did come from it. Um, and one last work from this section of the exhibition is an artwork by Andrew Carney called Unfolding Sheets Towards a View of One's Head. Um, it's based on images of heads uh, made by photographing slices of frozen heads in the 1890s, a pretty gruesome process undertaken by Glasgow surgeon William McEwen. And what Andrew Carney has done is taken sections of these images and used a laser to not just to print them, but to burn them into the pages of a folding book. So they grow fainter as the book progresses and the gaps in the image then become as important as the marked areas. Um, it's a really interesting way of kind of reinterpreting, I think, the three dimensional structure of the brain. Um, gives a lot of cause for thought about what our brains are like, and um, both kind of metaphorically when we feel like they're like a sieve and they've got gaps in them, but also pathologically when things go wrong and they do start to develop gaps. Um, and curatorially speaking, they're also really unnerving objects because they smell very heavily of burning. And I'm not used to having things like that in the library or um, in a display case, but they are, they are really wonderful, wonderful objects. Okay, so, I said one of the motivations for this exhibition was to think about who the people in the pictures are. And in the next section called Being the Body, I really go head on into thinking about how the way these pictures are made affects the way we think about the people who were used to make them. So here we have two different illustrations of the same subject matter, the muscles of the human back, but they are really very different ways of depicting it. On the left-hand side is an, an 
etching by John Bell. Etching is a technique where you can have a lot of freedom in the lines you create. And you're not trying to burrow into copper, but you can be much uh, looser in the way you create the lines, which means he creates this amazingly gothic image. He was doing this on purpose. He was doing it to um, react against pictures of anatomy that were too neat and tidy and gave what he thought was a false view. He wanted medical students to know what they were getting involved in. But I wonder whether he pushes it a bit far in this picture. The bound feet of the corpse don't just speak to me, certainly of the way you might manipulate a body in order to get it set up for dissection. They also speak of torture. The way the flesh is dripping off the body doesn't just say dissection is messy. It says these bodies are being maltreated. But on the other hand, the image on the right hand side, this beautiful, clean, perfect body standing as if still alive, floating in the ether with no background, no history, no uh, future, just a sort of idealised platonic body, maybe isn't a, a more realistic view either. Um, it's easier to interpret the muscles, sure, but it is easier for us looking at that picture to forget that people were dug up without their consent to be dissected to be the inspiration, to be the subject matter for this picture. And there isn't a right or wrong answer. Um, I have particular views that have developed as I've spent a lot of time looking at these pictures, but I'm not saying this is what everyone should think. I just think it is an interesting thing to look at these pictures and consider what our emotional reactions are, as well as what our intellectual reactions to the medical subject matter might be. I think this next picture, it's quite hard not to have some sort of reaction to. It's one of the more shocking medical images that I've seen. It comes from a French book of the middle of the 18th century, in which the author, Jacques Gauthier Dagoty, uh, was, he said, trying to make the image of death look agreeable. I have never been certain about this, because to me, this picture reads like two people in bed in a loving embrace the person on the left leaning in to kiss the person on the right, seemingly unaware that they've each got half their head missing. It doesn't look agreeable to me. It looks voyeuristic um, and pretty creepy. But uh, Gautier Dagoty said that people don't want to learn about anatomy unless it looks nice, so I'm going to try and make it look nice. But also he was trying to sell books. He had developed um, a printing technique of colour printing with four separate colour plates. Um, engraved using the mezzotint process, so they're quite grainy and dark. And he needed to sell his books because this was a, a complicated and difficult process. And um, he needed to shift the, the huge volumes, really, really big. So I can't show you very well on this camera, but like, you know, uh, two or three foot tall books. Um, and he needed to shift them. Um, so I think probably having quite scandalous pictures in them was one way to try and do that. Uh, the mezzotint technique isn't terribly effective for medical illustration anyway, because you don't get a very high level of detail um, and it didn't really catch on as a medical um, illustration technique. <clears throat> um, possibly people didn't want to be associated with pictures that look quite like this. This is not a rare example from that book either. There are a lot of quite shocking depictions in it. These pictures are an exception in the exhibition because they show people who donated their bodies to medical science and gave consent to be dissected and drawn. Um, there are two pencil drawings by the artist Angela Palmer made in Oxford. And I think they're an interesting counterpoint to the previous couple of slides, because although we know that they were made with consent, I still find them quite difficult images. I find these very intimate portrayals of people in death. Um, depending on my own personal mood, sometimes I see them as looking very peaceful. Sometimes I see them as looking kind of screwed up in pain. Um, and it's also, I think, interesting to me to think about drawing people's faces in a dissecting room when then that's not the bit that's been dissected. That's not the reason everyone is there. People are there to see the insides. But Angela has chosen to draw their faces and memorialise them, um, but also that still feels in a way like an invasive procedure because the face carries such a lot of information about us, um, about our personalities and our emotions and everything like that. Now, of course, that is a much greater issue when we are still alive. Um, and anatomical illustrations, of course, are intended to show perfect bodies. They usually show us men in perfect health, usually young, usually quite muscly and fit. They deliberately ignore the physical realities of living in human bodies. Um, 
And it was quite hard for me to put together this exhibition without some sort of nod to the fact that we live in imperfect bodies, almost all of us. So we included these amazing ceramic works by artist Tamsin Van Essen. They're called medical heirlooms. Um, they're based on apothecary jars, chemists jars um, used in the past in apothecary shops. So that's where she gets the shape from. And then she's done amazingly inventive things with ceramics techniques to mark the insides and outsides of the jars to look like different medical conditions. Um, so if I start at the top right hand jar on the left hand image, um, the pink one with the white spots on it, that one and the one immediately beneath it both represent acne, either the pustules of acne or the scarring left after it. The two in the middle um, with the flaking skin, they represent psoriasis, a skin condition that makes the skin red and inflamed and, and it flake away. At the back left is osteoporosis, a bone condition that causes bones to become brittle and lose much of their density. And then at the far left hand side is a jar that's beautiful and pristine on its outside, but bright red and ugly and vicious inside. And that represents internal scarring. Um, those things that are going on inside people that we might never see, but have a huge impact on them. And I think these aren't only a, a cautionary tale for our interpersonal relationships with people. We never know what's going on with them um, and never more so than in these times. Um, but I think it also just highlights something that you see in a lot of pathology illustrations. This is two versions of a picture from a book about dermatology and skin diseases from the early 19th century. Um, which is interesting to me for lots of reasons. Um, one, because I have bad skin, um, so I feel for a lot of the people in the pictures. Two, because, again, these are always very personal pictures. You see identifying features, faces, ears, clothing, hands, all the things you can know someone from. And they're living people. So this woman in this picture might have been walking around London and identifiable at the time this book was published. Um, but also because they were important for printing technology. So the picture version on the left is the drawing, the original drawing in watercolours. The version on the right is the printed version, um, printed from an engraved plate, coloured by hand on the plate um, using a technique called a la poupée, which made this a vastly expensive book. Um, £12, 12 shillings, I think it went for. Um, I did write it down, but now I've lost the note of it. Yes, which is like 10 times as much as most medical books of the time. Um, so it was hugely important because in uh, dealing with dermatology, you really need to see colour and texture, um, but also uh, really out of the realms of most people's um, purses. But a lot of anatomical pictures weren't just made for specialist audiences. They were made for the general public. And that's what we get to in the next section of the exhibition. The Royal College of Physicians tried to ban this book. Uh, it was published in the early 17th century and it was um, all about anatomy, human anatomy, quite a big, thick book um, called Somatographia Anthropinae. Um, despite the Greek title, it was actually the rest of it in English. Uh, and it was not only words about anatomy, it was pictures about anatomy. And this is what really upset the physicians because it, they felt that it was giving too much knowledge to the general populace. They might not need to pay for physicians to find out about their health anymore, oh dear, but also they could find out about all sorts of illicit things like sex and reproduction. And this picture is actually an illustration of a pregnant woman, believe it or not, and it might not look very scandalous to our eyes, but the physicians of the time were very concerned that this was going to corrupt public morals. They didn't manage to ban all the copies and rip out all the chapters on sex and reproduction, but they did try to. Um, but I think it's interesting to think about the way anatomical pictures could be seen as a threat, um, threat to morals or a threat to professional uh, um, monopoly. Uh, now, the next picture I'm going to show you could well actually offend public morals or corrupt people. This is an anatomical picture from a series that covered the whole, all different parts of the body, uh, published in France again in the 1870s. And this is a, a flap anatomy, if you will, in that it has flaps of paper that you can lift up to reveal the internal anatomy. A very clever way of showing um, the three-dimensionality of the body because you can sort of sift through the layers. Um, but given the subject matter of this illustration, which is the female reproductive system, it does have a certain, um, well, it has a certain different effect, I think. 
Um, so I'm going to play this video through a couple of times because it's quite quick and it vanishes at the end. Let me just run that through again. So you can see it's a it's a phenomenally complicated image. It has probably about 16 or so layers in it. Um, and mounting it for display is really, really good fun because you spend a whole afternoon getting everything to stay in place. Um, but this is a really, I find this a really troublesome picture. Is it for the general public? Reasons it might be are that it's brightly coloured and fun to look at and it's you know interactive and lift the flaps and, you know, doesn't look very scientific. But on the other hand, it's hugely detailed. It goes into far more detail about the human anatomy, the female anatomy, um, than most people will have learnt in school in the UK, certainly in the 20th century. Um, so maybe it's for a scientific audience. Is it for medical students? Is it for titillation? One thing to me is certain is that it definitely expresses a certain attitude towards the human body, the female body, um, in the way it's coloured, this absolutely gruesome blue colour used for her body and the really brutal way it seems to dive into um, the female body. I think it's quite expressive of the way women's bodies have been treated in medicine and in society. Um, and that's something that artist Adelaide de Moa uh, tries to act against. She's a performance artist and she uses her own body as a tool in her art. So she applies pigment and paint to her own skin and um, creates prints directly onto paper. So she takes out all the middle men, and it is usually middle men in anatomical illustration, and she applies herself directly to the page. She reclaims the way women's bodies and particularly the way black women's bodies are represented. Um, so on the uh, left hand side of the image, you can see her work Fernande, which is part of the series Muse, Model or Mistress, inspired by thinking about the muses that Pablo Picasso used. Um, and on the right hand side, you can see her um, engaged in one of her performance pieces. This is also the only explicitly black body in the exhibition. I have absolutely no doubt that black and brown people's bodies were dissected in the anatomy theatres of many, if not all, the people who went to create the works that we've seen in this exhibition. But it's always white bodies we see on the page because white bodies were treated as the standard and as the norm. Um, and I think it's important that we recognise that it is the most marginalised people and the most marginalised bodies that were treated in these often incredibly inhumane ways to create the anatomical pictures um, that we see. OK, I realise I'm running quite long, uh, so I'm going to whiz ahead quite quickly through the next section, um, which is about some of the technologies that have developed for seeing inside the body. I take seeing um, in quite a loose sense. So I do start with things that don't see directly, but kind of see. So stethoscopes were invented in the early 19th century and the first English translation of the first book written about the stethoscope said that the inventor, um, René Lenec, had, quote, placed a window in the breast through which we can see the pre precise state of things within. So though we were seeing with our ears, we were for the first time seeing inside the human body in a whole new way. Those developments continued throughout the 19th century with um, devices like the sphygmograph, which is a way of charting the pulse on a little uh, paper chart and um, with a device that you put on the wrist and you get a trace that looks a bit like a heart trace out of it. Um, X-rays are, of course, the most famous way for seeing inside the body. And I just had to show you this brilliant video clip. This is from a clip, a clip from a much longer video at the, um, the, the Welcome Collection in London have. And um, it uses a technique called cine radiography, so film radiography. Um, and this was quite in vogue, but only very briefly, because you need to give someone quite a large dose of x-rays to get film of their joints. And the problem with a large dose of x-rays is that it also gives them cancer. Um, so you can't do it very much. But this film, these films were used to show, um, certainly in this one, a comparison between what you see on the x-ray image and what you see on the outside of the body. Because x-rays are very ubiquitous today. We're very familiar with them. They seem very normal. But you still have to interpret them. They're not a direct representation. They are a translation of what's going on inside. And uh, all these scans we have today aren't necessarily an answer. We often think that they are an answer, um, but they aren't. They 
often raise more questions than they answer. So you get a scan of something that feels wrong um, and it doesn't tell you anything useful. It just raises more questions. And these two textile works by artist Rebecca Harris, who is going to be leading our next late on the 1st of October, um, are two expressions of that. Um, and you can read more about those online. So that brings me to the last section of the exhibition, which is where we get some really big hitting famous books. We start with the first printed anatomical illustration of a, a dissected body as if dissected in front of us. Interestingly, it's the female body. Um, you might be forgiven for not realising that because uh, it's not the best picture of the female anatomy we've seen this evening or ever. Um, but it is a landmark in uh, medical uh, books. The first edition came out in 1493. Our copy at the RCP is from 1500, but we only have to go 50 years, fewer than 50 years later to get something a good deal more detailed um, with the work of Andreas Vesalius, uh, famous for the beauty, the artistic uh, sophistication and the anatomical accuracy of his woodcut illustrations. Um, these are just three from a huge series in one of the most famous books in medical history on the fabric of the human body. Um, this book was not only uh, very important medically, it was instantly a collector's item. It's a huge and very expensive book then and certainly today. Um, and it shows the way in which medical imagery isn't just about medical research and medical practice. It has been something desirable as a collector's item for a very long time. Um, another book, we're going to leap forward quite a long way in history now to the middle of the 19th century again to Gray's Anatomy. Uh, which was very um, new in medical illustration because of the way it actually incorporated text onto the image, which makes it a lot easier if you're learning medicine, um, rather than having to refer to a huge list of labels on the next page or over the page or at the end of the book, or kind of map lines as they, I'm sure you'll do this in biology at school, you draw labels on lines, and then you can't remember which one comes where. Here it's got all the writing on the picture. So as you look at this, look at the structure, you learn the name of it as well, which helps quite a lot. Although later editions had to abandon this because our understanding of the body got so complex, you couldn't fit all the text on anymore, sadly. But this is one of the things that made it famous. But it's not only textbooks that have been important for teaching and learning medicine. For a very long time throughout history, it was important that people made their own drawings not only cutting bodies open themselves, but actually then drawing what they see. And there is nothing better than drawing for actually understanding what you're seeing in front of you, whether that's a knitting stitch or a human body or a landscape or a butterfly or whatever it might be. This is a beautiful notebook um, that was a real problem for me as a curator because I just couldn't choose which page to show in the exhibition because they're all brilliant. Um, from a medical student who was studying medicine in London in 1904, and he makes pen drawings and ink drawings and pencil drawings and sketches and diagrams and really realistic depictions and like this the whole way through. And I think that's something that isn't anymore a part of medical practice, certainly not nearly as much as it used to be. And the final piece I want to show you is, I think, maybe the, you know, the apotheosis of the human body, um, because anatomy is all about trying to confine the body, trying to make it regular and understandable and orderly and repeatable. And bodies aren't like that. Bodies are all different shapes and sizes have different bits in them, work in different ways. And the artwork we finish the exhibition with sort of explodes across our display case um, like the human body kind of breaking free and saying, I will not be contained. It's a work by Lucy Lyons. It's called Impossible Pathologies. And in it, she creates sort of nightmarish, impossible, imagined um, versions of human organs that spread out all across the case, um, demonstrating her amazing drawing skills. So she drew these based on Victorian pathology samples um, and then stitched them back together in a new and quite nightmarish arrangement. Um, and that's really where I want to end by saying the human body is difficult and complicated and we should all pay attention to that, uh, certainly when we're looking at medical pictures. Um, so like we've said, do go to our website and take a look at the online version of the exhibition. There's audio, there's video, there's books you can flick through um, and there's lots of words written about them as well. Thank you all very much. Lovely, thank you, um, Katie. I've popped us all back up on the screen. 
um, as we'll move on to the Q&A section of the evening. Um, but first, I just want to say a big thank you to Katie for that. It's been fantastic. Um, I think Susanna mentioned in the chat, I, I agree with Larry, wonderful. She said, amazing, beautiful and disgusting. And I think that <laughs> sums it up all nicely. Um, and thank you. Yes, there's some applause in the chat. We shall give it over to Katie. Um, but now it's an opportunity for anyone who might have uh, some questions. Um, please pop them in the Q&A. Uh, you can, for Katie or wider questions about the museum, Larry he is here as well. Um, and uh, yeah, please just uh, throw open to the floor. And uh, if anyone, well, we haven't got any in right now, but I know there was someone, um, oh, we've just got one. Um, someone's asked about Cunningham's dissection. Um, I Hopefully that means something to Katie. I'm, I'm lacking knowledge here. <laughs> um, Cunningham... So Cunningham is a 19th century author, I think. Um, is this a question about whether I should have in included him? Uh, it just, it, Zeba, uh, so apologies if I've mispronounced your name, has just put Cunningham's dissection question mark. So I'm, I'm guessing, is it is it anything we've included or was it in the exhibit? No, question? so Cunningham doesn't feature and I'm my mind has gone completely blank on the significance uh. of Cunningham. So if Zeba would like to remind me at least another name of his, oh. I can dig into my mind and see what I remember about him. Okay, well, well, whilst we wait for Zebus to come back on that, we've had another one through, which is, how concerned were you about any of the objects eliciting negative emotional responses in visitors? That's a really good question. Um, I think negatives are really, without wishing to be too wishy-washy about it, negatives are really interesting. Um, it's, it's interesting to define what counts as negative. Um, because I don't think if someone if someone comes and looks at this exhibition and finds the images um, unpleasant or distasteful or gory or you know hard to look at because they don't like innards or because they think the bodies have been mistreated, that's that's a negative response. But I don't think that's I wouldn't be disappointed. I wouldn't be unhappy that that had happened because mm -hmm. I think these are pictures about which we can feel disgusted and unhappy and we shouldn't think that just because they are science we have to kind of suck up our feelings about them and just say well obviously because of science we've got to approve of them and find them pleasant um i would be i would think i hadn't done a, a good enough job if people came and found the images disgusting and also found the way we'd written about them and the way we display displayed them hadn't contextualized that significantly so if they felt we were being gratuitous Mm -hmm. um, and that's a really fine line for me in displaying these pictures because something like that flap anatomy book of the um, human, the, the female human reproductive system, for me, it's it's a really fine line between wow, what a cool object, you know, really detailed, really difficult to make, really amazing to display, but also actually quite a grotesque way of showing a woman's body. Um, yeah. And so I think if someone comes and looks at the exhibition and thinks, oh, they've just put this stuff out to get a response and they're just doing it to titillate or they're just doing it to um, upset people, then that that would be a negative response I, I was upset about. But if people come and find them really difficult, then I don't think that's a bad thing. Um, it is something we considered. Um, I think different organisations would approach their messaging around an exhibition like this differently. We are a medical organisation. And so we didn't feel it was untoward if people were in the building, if they saw medical pictures. Mm. I think if you're a general art gallery and you're showing these images, you would want to consider more, sorry, bang, bang. Um, you would want to consider more carefully how you messaged entrances to the gallery and telling people what kind of thing they might be expecting to see when they got there. Okay, thank you. Um, so we've had a couple more questions and as someone's mentioned, Cunningham was, a, it was apparently another a dissection manual in three volumes used in the 1960s. He was oh, a okay. List. So um, I don't know whether so, we had yeah, that in a collection so, like, or not. I guess so if this is, medical students get really attached to their dissection <laughs> manuals because there is a, a guidebook that you are supposed to learn. And if, if you can just learn everything in this book, then you will have learned anatomy and you'll pass your incredibly difficult exams. Um, and actually, that's something I would have quite liked to explore further is these relationships. So some people are all about Netta, some are about Ellis, some are about Cunningham or Gray or different things. And there was some there are some really nice clips um, in the oral history um, 
uh, clips that we have from some of our fellows about how they kind of they bought Grey's Anatomy when they went up to med school and looked at it and thought I will never learn 1200 pages <laughs> and then I did um, and that you could do a whole separate exhibition about people's personal copies of those books and how they how they got them through medicine. So we um, do have a copy of that in our library so ah, it's sort of lovely. part of our reference material. Great I'll, I will look it up next time I can actually get to the books. Um, so we've had another question. Um, you said that only white bodies were regularly depicted in anatomy books. If marginalised bodies were often used as models, how did that translate into the textbooks? After all the belief in physio, uh, my apologies, I cannot pronounce that word. Yes, yeah. um, informed representation of race. That's a really good question. It's something into which I haven't delved sufficiently deeply. So there are there are issues here about what bodies you have access to to dissect and then also your opinions about those bodies and what you think about them. In the 19th century, there were lots of scientists and researchers who were developing racialized theories about human bodies that said certain bodies are better than others. White bodies are better than black people's bodies. Um, and they created all kinds of appalling hierarchies of goodness, essentially. What is more evolved? Mm -hmm. What is better? What is medically sounder? Um, and that would, those theories would say that um, dissecting a black African person's body wouldn't tell you useful information about anatomy because those bodies were considered to be inferior. On the other hand, bodies were in short supply. And people were cutting up whichever bodies they could get hold of. And marginalised bodies, I think, would be more... Um, would, the bodies of people with the lowest standing in society, which would mean um, people who weren't white, but also the poorest people, the people who were immigrants, the people who weren't locals to a town, um, the people who didn't have much say during life would also not have much say in death about how their bodies were treated. Mm -hmm. So those bodies would be more likely to find their way onto the dissecting slab. And a lot of anatomical pictures are composites. They're based on cutting up lots and lots and lots of people and creating an idealised version from that. Mm -hmm. um, so I think you can hold both to be true, although there are definitely some people who wouldn't have wanted to use certain people's bodies, black bodies, brown bodies, to inform what they thought a body should really look like. Mm. That's a bit of a hedging my bets answer. It's it's a difficult topic. Um, thank you. Um, okay, we've had a had an interesting one here. Um, so from from Sarah Griffin, who's interested in the fantastic images we get of dissected men standing like statues in pastoral landscapes. Mm. She'd always heard that those were to get round pornography laws. Have you ever come across that idea? No, actually. <laughs> it's a, um, yeah, not what I thought of. So, hello, if you're the Sarah Griffin I know, hello, Sarah, hope you're well. Um, I, so I did, I do remember reading an article about pornography laws, but later than we tend to get people in anatomical landscapes. I mean, I, I really need to read up on that. So if you've got a reference, drop me a line, put it in the chat or track me down, send it to me, um, because... It's a question everyone always asks. Why are these 16th mm. century Italian ana anatomy books showing us people in landscapes? Partly, I think it's just because the idea of drawing a person, I, my personal view is possibly it's just the idea of drawing a person with nothing behind them just doesn't exist in art yet. Mm. Like we just haven't invented that scientific way of drawing things where you just, they kind of exist out of space because before that art's always about things existing in space. So you have to put a nice background in. Uh, I always, I also have theories about whether it's the artists who are doing the woodcuts actually showing off the rest of their skills because they don't want to be drawing dead bodies all their life. They want to be doing real art. Um, so it's partly that. But uh, maybe it's getting around porn laws as well. I mean, a lot of the pictures aren't terribly, they're not mainstream sexy, but <laughs> it's, it's a good, as good a theory as any of the others. I mean, there are there are books much later, so in the 18th and 19th centuries, which are definitely basically porn but they call themselves medicine to get round yeah. laws um, and I did look and we don't have any in the library otherwise I'd definitely put one on display <laughs> um, interesting comparator 
Um, okay, so I'm sorry, everyone, we are running over a little bit. I, I can see some of you have, have, have left already, but if you don't mind, we've just got a, um, one more question, sorry, two more questions um, to, to finish up. So one for Katie and one for Larry. Um, so the one for Katie's come in from Holly, um, who's wondering, when you have a wealth of objects to choose from, how do you decide which to display and what story to tell? Oh, it's so hard, Holly, it's so hard. Um, so there are some practical considerations. We have, at the RTP, we have display cases of a set size and things have to fit in the cases or have to be suitable for using as reproductions on the walls if they're very big. Um, so that helps to narrow things down. Um, for this exhibition, I was driven very visually. So I took a lot of reference photos as I was researching. So I spent a lot of time going through kind of book by book on the shelves um, in the anatomy sections of the library, looking at things and taking pictures that I thought were visually striking as well as being interesting for other reasons. And then um, I printed them all out. This is a very, very old school way of doing it. Printed them all out and laid them out on a table and just started moving them around to try and create connections between them. Connections of subject and composition. So at one point I thought there was going to be a whole wall of brains because there were so many good brain pictures and the wall of brains never happened. Um, and then so you see which things looked similar or looked good next to each other or had similar ideas or themes. And it was just very iterative. The only way to do it is to do it once and decide it's wrong and then do it again and decide that's less wrong and do it a third time and decide it's less wrong again. Um, so it's, and you can, I mean, I'm still not happy with, there are things I didn't include that I would really have liked to. Um, some things that went in on now, I'm like, oh, is that really the best choice? And it's just, it's just very, very difficult. But ultimately it was picking things that I felt I could say something interesting about, which is why I get really bad at keeping to time when I talk about it, because I have something interesting to say about them all, so sorry. And you should have seen her desk while she was working all of that out. It was, um, <laughs> <quite> <laughs> yeah, my poor colleagues, every day was, come and look at this body day. <laughs> okay, um, so we had one come in a little bit earlier from uh, Ziba. My, again, my apologies if I'm pronouncing your name wrong. Um, is there a brain specimen in the museum? And I think Larry might be able to help us with that one. So um, although we are a medical museum, we're possibly not quite what you would expect um, because we are primarily kind of artworks and solid objects and books rather than medical specimens. And that's because of the historic division of how medicine was set up. So there's sort of roughly three groups, apothecaries, who are sort of like chemists are today, um, physicians who would be the sort of well-educated university men um, who would diagnose you, and then surgeons who would do all the dirty cutting work. And because we're the physicians, not the surgeons, we don't have that much of a kind of big, um, what's it called, medical specimen collection. Although we did have um, one in the past, which we no longer have, because although there were those distinctions I just said, it, you know, things are never that clear cut. So certain physicians did have their own collections, which they donated to the college. Um, and then you get into really complicated things about caring for them properly and having licenses for looking after human tissue. And they were transferred elsewhere in the end. So we don't actually have any specimens that you might expect at the moment. Um, we only have seven items of human remains in the collection. So six of them are the anatomical tables that Katie mentioned at the beginning of her talk, which if you are able, able to visit the building are on the second floor gallery. So they're really fantastic. Um, and the other thing that we have, which I don't think is currently on display because it had been out for a very long time, it was getting a bit light damaged, is a call. So the covering that a um, fetus is covered with when it comes out um, they sometimes remain intact and they used to be kept as lucky charms so the one that we have was collected by someone who was interested in kind of popular medicine and folk beliefs um, and it actually has the name of the infant that it came from engraved on the case that it's kept in but other than those we don't have any human remains at all I'm afraid. <laughs> um, can I just chime in there as well um, so the brain slices that were used by William McEwen for the photographs of frozen bits of brain are preserved in the uh, museum, the Hunterian Museum in Glasgow at the University of Glasgow. Um, he was a surgeon and professor there and they've got lots of brain sections that he used. So mm. then they do have pictures of them online as well. So you can have a look at those. Okay, um, so we really do have to uh, 
clean up. We've got one one last minute question squeezed in from James Walker, which I might, <laughs> if everyone's okay to stick around just for a minute longer and we'll try that mm -hmm. and then we will have to stop. So um, James asked with regards to comparison between the very cleanly drawn muscles and image and the visceral dissection um, image resembling torture. Were there many examples of images depicting the realities of dissection? So was that unique or did you find quite a few? Um, he says personally, he did find it difficult comparing the realities of dissection to the images in the textbook. Mm -hmm. um, so there are definitely more that are clean cut um, and bells are, so the, the really grotesque one, the really gothic one is the, mm -hmm. I'd say the furthest extreme that I've seen. Um, it's not the only picture in that book that's like that. So it's not, I didn't just pick one really far out picture. He does have quite a few that are like that. Um, there are some others that have a, a nod to realism, but in a different way. So the, the picture of the nerves from early on with the, the chest being opened out is a sort of halfway house in the way it shows tools, but not the grotesqueness at all. Um, and there are some famous illustrations by, oh no, is it Bidloo? It might be Bidloo or it might be Albinus or it might be the two of them, because I think one sort of took over the other's work. Um, from the uh, 17th century or late, uh, early 18th century um, in the Low Countries, which are noted for their realism because they show things like um, piece, uh, dissected specimens displayed on everyday objects like books and tables with cloths and things around them and the pins that hold the, the flesh out are shown, but also things like flies. Um, so there's a sort of fly famously lands on one of them. Um, which might be a realism thing, but again, might also be a sort of artistic um, showing off your artistic skills or your kind of compositional skills. Um, and it relates in a way to kind of golden age Netherlands art where you get kind of bugs on flower paintings as well. So um, not so much realism, actually. And I think partly because the realism is, isn't all that useful. It's, it's useful in maybe preparing medical students for shock. Um, but because every every messy body is going to be a different mess. I don't know how you could usefully help people identify the structure they're looking for in the mess. If you're not showing the structure clearly, you're just showing a different mess. But I mean, I haven't been, like I say, I haven't seen it for myself. So I'm not best placed, qualify, uh, best qualified to say, really. And I think today with preservation techniques, of course, it's very different to how it would have been mm. without the preservation yes, techniques. Indeed. The earlier drawings yeah. were being these, made. these were all being done without formaldehyde or anything, mm. any kind of preservation or even decent refrigeration. So, mm. yeah, very different world. Yes. OK. Um, all right. I think we should finish up now because we've run over a little bit. <laughs> Thank you to everyone who's stuck with us. I'm just going to pop this up briefly. Um, this is our upcoming events. I'm just going to give a final plug before we go. Um, so if you guys would like to come along to our open house uh, on 19th September, we've got a virtual architecture tour with Dr. Barnabas Calder, an artist workshop with Amanda Couch, whose work you saw in the talk this evening, um, and a new film by our assistant archivist, uh, Felix, about archives and architecture at the RCP. And of course, our next digital RCP Museum Late on Thursday, 1st October, which is with Rebecca Harris. Um, and her uh, method of artwork, which she calls stitching science. Um, so if you just head on to our website, um, history.rcplondon.ac.uk, you can find out the wonderful online exhibition that Katie's now done. Um, and you can explore the audio clips and video clips. I know some of you had a little bit of difficulty seeing all of the video clips and audio. So all of those are available on the online exhibition. We have also recorded Katie's talk from this evening and the Q&A. So um, we'll hopefully be able to get that up next week, fingers crossed, onto YouTube. So if any of you had difficulties at the beginning and missed anything, you can watch back um, and take a look. Um, and yeah, just thank you very much, Katie, for this evening and Larry and uh, to all of you who joined us. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone. See you soon. Bye. Bye.